Good morning, everybody. How fantastic to be here in person. I know this is the creativity track, but I'm going to start off with a couple of data points for you, just to um, get ourselves started. In 2021, the Edelman Trust Barometer did some research 12, across 12 markets, 12,000 people. What they found was that 77% of people want brands to talk about their products in the context of how COVID is affecting their lives. That's obvious when you think about it, but people's luck, people have been affected by COVID quite differently across the world at different times. And COVID is only the most current of the major issues the world faces and people face around the world. Second data point for you, Deloitte Global Marketing Trends 2021, what they found was customers are 1.6 times more likely to buy from you than your competitors when the brand demonstrates humanity. Now, humanity obviously has a lot to do with values and culture, which are deeply seated in what people think about locally. Localization is often seen as a, an afterthought to many businesses when they're creating marketing campaigns. But actually, localization will drive sales if you do it properly, as we've seen from those statistics. Um, and it's a minefield to get right. Too often, businesses are creating marketing campaigns and then they're translating. And they're wondering why those campaigns don't land well in market. And if they don't land well, you're not going to get the sales. You're not going to get the brand uplift. So in today's world, localization is one of the most important things for brands to be thinking about very early. Now, I'm delighted to be here with Lucy. Um, Lucy started at Fitbit in 2014, which is the same time that Friedman started working with Fitbit. And we're going to do this as a bit of a Q&A. Um, we're going to hear about uh, Lucy's journey of success with Fitbit and Fit Fitbit's success from their sort of early days through the IPO. And now they've been um, bought by Google and I'm sure we're going to go on to even greater things um, in the next few years. So here we go. So Lucy, welcome. Hi. Um, tell us a little bit about your journey at Fitbit, um, initially working in your EMEA marketing role. Um, and now heading marketing for the UK business. Yeah, so as you said, I've joined Fitbit over seven years ago now. So back when we were just a tiny kind of company, there were just six of us running European marketing in a really rapid, fast-moving environment. It was all about the Internet of Things. It was about connectivity with apps. It was a really exciting space, very, very fast, dynamic market. And we very rapidly grew across Europe. We expanded into 12 countries, I think, almost overnight, probably really at the point yep. that we brought you guys That's on correct. board. And it was kind of a, a breathtaking pace of what was happening. We went through an IPO. The company kind of grew up. We became slightly more mature, slightly bigger, but still really harnessing, I think, uh, a, a spirit of being a startup. But now we're entering into a new world. In February, the acquisition was completed by Google, and that's a real game changer for the company. Um, and particularly, you know, as we come through, you know, this this pandemic, as we enter into whatever this new normal is is going to be, I think it's a, an amazing opportunity for Fitbit as a brand. When people's health is now so important, managing your own personal health has never been on everybody's radar so much as it is now. So I think that really coupled with, um, with you know, the Google acquisition and all the amazing things that that's going to bring to Fitbit as the brand is, uh, yeah, it's going to be exciting times, a new phase for us. It will be. No, it's, it's a fantastic time to be part of the business um, for what's going to be happening in the future. But you've obviously worked at an EMEA level and a local level, mm. um, and that's a situation that many you know, marketers face. They transition from local to global and global to local. Um, what are some of the key challenges that you faced at the email level and now at the local level? And um, what would be your tips for marketers trying to make global marketing work? Mm. 
I think, you know, it's, it's always about just trying to find that balance, you know, because as a brand, you absolutely need that big global halo. You need the power of the brand. But particularly, I think, in a space like, you know, when you're talking about your personal health and wellness and fitness as we are, it absolutely has to connect locally. And I think one of the, the first kind of, uh, kind of breakthroughs, if you like, that we had was when we really started to act, when I was at an EMEA level, as an EMEA region. So not just taking global creative and doing a copy paste, but actually really getting into the level of understanding that. And the first step behind that was, was to gather those insights. And it was quite fascinating, ultimately, that you know, when we looked at what health and wellness and fitness meant across you know, our key markets, UK, Germany, France, Italy, Spain, actually, it was really different. So our core brand values around making everyone in the world healthier really meant something kind of different in each one of those markets. So by conducting research to understand that, I think it really opened up that opportunity to, for us to be able to act at a regional level and then um, a local level, ultimately, so that a global brand campaign talking about being healthy, being well, actually really resonated then at a local message um, level as to what that specifically meant. So yeah, research insight was a, a key thing. And then I think as well, at that point, when we look at it locally, was actually the specifics of the language that we were using and the specifics of the imagery, you know, to make sure that what health meant in France was really what we were talking about, what they understood. So all of those nuances coming down, um, we had to translate all of that. And sometimes bringing your global colleagues along on that journey can be an interesting one. Bit of a challenge, isn't it? Because you've got the, the Fitbit HQ in California and they've got their view of what you know health is about and what the brand needs to be. You come into Europe and it's different. And I remember that piece of research where, you know, for the, the I'm I'm sort of um, summarising here for you guys. But for the French, you know, health was about the joie de vivre, having a good life and it, be able to enjoy a good life. With the Italians, it was more about the fashion side of health and being fashionable mm. and trendy, and the product had to look great. I think for the German market, the high level was, you know, it's about being competitive with your health and, you know, doing better than your, your peers. Um, now that insight needs to be fed back into the global function early in the process. Otherwise you end up with a campaign that's coming out of California. They are trying to edit and make work for Europe. So was that, how, how did the global creative function coordinate or not with the EMIR and UK functions? What would be your tips? for someone in, your, in a UK position trying to influence global? I think it really has to be based on insight, research-based insight. You know, if you're gonna have a conversation that has gravitas, that is believable and is not just, you know, me saying, well, I really feel this about the UK market or the French market or wherever, grounding that in really credible research um, is, is absolutely fundamental. And ultimately, I think it's, it's being very respectful of, of what those company brand values are. I think that Fitbit has been successful as a company. One of the reasons being is because we have been so consistent in staying with our brand values. So really respecting those brand values, but then translating them mm. into the local resonance backed by that research. That's where our most valuable conversations came with the global yeah. teams. And, and they're getting it, I think, aren't they? Ed, you After know. seven years, they're starting <laughs> to get it. And I always say, you know, translation is not about translating words. It's about translating the brand to make it connect with people around the world. And that is, that does require upfront up insight, feeding that into the creative process, making sure that all of the global, regional, local market teams understand how to do that well. So it really resonates when it lands in market. Um, so... So do you have any advice for marketers working for fast growing tech brands on how to achieve local relevance while growing a, st a strong brand? Well, I guess uh, firstly, just be willing to move really fast um, and accept that, you know, sometimes like good enough is good enough. I came from a big kind of corporate background where it was really about the minutiae of the detail. And I think, you know, in a, in a fast moving kind of tech environment, in a startup environment, sometimes you accept that good enough is good enough, but you really look after some of the core things like language and interpretation, 
like legals, always the legals first, keep on board with the lawyers. Um, but other than that, except that some of the other things might not be kind of quite so perfect. Yeah, yeah. What's your view in terms of um, pushing the boundary with campaigns as opposed to being more conservative? If you're a fast-moving tech brand, you're trying to break things, I guess. And does that mean really push the boundary on, on the marketing communications or is it more important to be more cautious and, and take the customer with you? I mean, you most definitely want to be taking the customer with you. I think building that loyalty and the advocacy in your customer base is, is everything. It certainly was in our journey at, at Fitbit. But I think there's a lot of, uh, we have a lot of respect for our, our brand values, our mission statement, and who we are being as a company, you know, in terms of motivating, um, insightful, inclusive. But yeah, sometimes breaking a few of those little boundaries in order to make it resonate really locally because that's where it gets more powerful. Yeah, well, that's great. That's a good segue to the recent um, out of home campaign. Mm -hmm. Welcome back, London, Manchester, etc. Um, welcome back, stay well. What were the goals for that campaign for Fitbit and um, what were the key learnings that you can share? It was really about harnessing a just a completely unique local moment. We launched a campaign on the 17th of May um, and it was an out of home campaign. And that coincided with the lifting of restrictions, the second phase of lifting restrictions. And there was this kind of real sense of optimism, I think, over the UK as we emerged from our houses and we took a step outside our front door and we started to embrace life again. And you know, that wasn't happening anywhere else in Europe at yep, that point. Right. We were really kind of, yeah, we were, we were ahead of the curve. So we wanted to create a truly local campaign that felt positive, that celebrated the fact that we were actually outdoors again, that we were moving around, we were in the cities. And we also really wanted to celebrate the fact that instead of saying, stay safe, we've been telling everyone to stay safe for so long. We wanted to promote this real feel good message of welcome back and, and, and stay well. And ultimately that's what Fitbit is about, is helping people to stay well, to manage their personal health. So it's a, a really perfect local opportunity for us. That campaign wouldn't have worked in any other market at right. that point. So yeah. it, it was purely, purely for the UK. Yeah, yeah. And how did the global business respond to that campaign, which was generated in the UK for that UK welcome back moment. What was the feedback you got from, oh, from Global? Hugely envious because they wanted to be out and about as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think, you know, the, the overall response was so positive because it is so much about tapping into those unique moments you know, as, we, as we emerge into our new world of post-pandemic, uh, living with pandemic. I think just the the opportunity to be in that moment and take those opportunities is something that we're taking forward into future plans. Yeah, that's great. Uh, it was a it was a fantastic campaign to work on with you guys. Mm -hmm. Done really fast. Yeah, I think. very fast. Um, and I think again, it you know reflecting what the uh, the Edelman Trust Barometer said, it really reflected the mood of the country at that time, which is so important. Um, and why the Fitbit brand has been so strong despite the ferocious competition from you know, some of the, the, the large tech uh, companies out there. Um, can you tell us um, a little bit about how you see the world in the new Google environment? I know you can't maybe talk too much, but everyone's keen to understand what might it mean for Fitbit? What might it mean for the Google health business overall? Um, it'd be lovely to hear what you can share about that. <laughs> I think it's really interesting because you know, lots of things has changed for, for Fitbit as, as a company, but actually nothing changes because we have been so consistent with our, our brand mission and our brand values for the past you know, 13 years, as long as the company has existed. And that will not change. We will still maintain our mission to make everyone in the, in the world healthier, inspired by data and insights. And that will only be powered more by, by Google. You know, they have a core health pillar as well. And I think bringing together those two things in this new world where we are, you know, we want the ability to manage our own personal health. We want to see our own personal key health indicators on our wrist, not in a doctor's surgery. And that is what is going to power the Fitbit brand. Yeah. It's an exciting future there. Exciting um, times. Let me ask you this question around um, local marketing again versus global marketing. 
global, that if you can have a very successful global marketing function, you can obviously spend money wisely, you can pool it across markets, and you can build a very consistent brand. Um, but it's very hard to get the local flavor. So as a UK marketer, would you rather have your own budget that you could spend as you wish, maybe with some brand guidelines, or do you feel it's beneficial to have the global function providing you with strategies and campaigns that you can leverage and adapt? What, what's, your, what's your personal view? And, and because I think a lot of businesses move back and forth between mm. trying to be very global, be very local to get the right balance of local authenticity and global brand consistency. Yeah, I mean, I think as a global brand, we're lucky to have a really creative um, kind of uh, marketing team over in, in San Francisco, working with great agencies. And, and they bring that consistency of, of who we are as a brand. But I think then it, it's about finding that balance to how to connect locally. How did you use you know, our social channels, our community channels to take those big messages and really translate them so that you know, health and fitness and wellness you know, from a UK um, consumer perspective is, is really a conversation that we're having, not just here, but really at that local level. Fantastic, good. Um, okay, final question I'd like to ask you, Lucy. Um, <clears throat> There's a lot of talk about authenticity and how important it is to be authentic when you, when you act as a brand. Um, and too often it feels like another buzzword which we've got a lot at the moment. It's um, what is your take on being an authentic global brand when considering all of your different market, local markets? How can you be authentic across all of those markets? I think it's really about consistency um, in, in our approach, in our brand values but also very much about having that local understanding and that local connection. Um, it's great having you know, big brand campaigns, but to be truly authentic, we have to be in that conversation every day, whether that's a fitness conversation, a wellness, a health conversation. We have to be consistent and we have to be really, really human about it. And I think that's one of the things about the Fitbit brand and something that we really champion in the UK is that we are truly a human brand and we really welcome that level of interaction yeah. on a personal level. That's great. Um, I mean, localization, as I said before, I think it's a very, very important topic and much misunderstood. And communicating in local markets from a global perspective is actually a minefield. And we, we all see the major cock-ups or screw-ups that brands make, like the, the D&G chopsticks advert. We, we know about the real screw-ups. What we don't hear about are the missed opportunities. If you really localize well, take in insights from local markets, build it into your communications plan, get it to market effectively, your sales are going to rise. Your brand value is going to increase. So it's not so much about avoiding cock-ups, which is relatively easy. And if you just go for the avoidance strategy, you're going to have bland campaigns, not brand, ca bland campaigns. It's about how can you really touch people locally on a global level. Uh, Friedman today is launching something called the Friedman Localization Index. Um, a few of my colleagues around can give you access to that. It's a self-assessment tool. It's going to allow you to assess your localization capabilities um, or sophistication on six different levels, um, how your global to local teams work, and the operation with agencies, um, level of cultural competence and sophistication of actually um, understanding local audiences, um, ability to ensure brand integrity and safety, so the global brand stuff and the compliance element, dynamic capability, so how quickly can you adapt to what is happening around the world locally? Because in order to be truly locally authentic, you need to adapt fast. And then your technology and your measurement systems. Um, so it's a self-assessment. It'd be great to have all of you guys do that. Um, yeah, all of you guys do that as soon as you can. And then we'll be able to publish benchmarks and share with you how well you're doing vis-a-vis -vis alternatives.